Hi, everyone. I am Jam Iwuyor, uh, founder of the National Black Cultural Information Trust. This is the Reparation Information Thought Series, a periodic strategic webinar featuring reparations experts and racial justice thought leaders engaged in critical discussion, reflection, and analysis on issues pertinent to the movement for reparatory justice in the U.S. and abroad. It is co-hosted by the Reparation Education Project headed by Nikichi Taifa and the National Black Cultural Information Trust. Today, we are discussing Shaping the Narrative, where we're having conversations with authors of books that are focused on reparations. We'd like to give a huge welcome to attorney Nikichi Taifa, who is the principal, who has been a principal player and catalyst in the reparation reparations movement for over 40 years. She is founder of the Reparation Education Project. The Reparation Education Project is a nonprofit organization that supports the escalating movement for reparations as a resource for those exploring historical and current information and analysis on reparations. A founding member of the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America, in COBRA, established in 1987, Taifa served as its first legislative commission chair for years and helped provide guidance and counsel to Congressman John Conyers in the initial drafting of the federal bill, H.R. 40. She is an inaugural commissioner of the 2015 established National African American Reparations Commission. We'd also like to give a great welcome to Dr. Mary Frances Berry, who is the Geraldine R. Segal Professor of American Social Thought Emerita and Professor of History. She received her PhD in history from the University of Michigan and JD from the University of Michigan Law. She is the author of 12 books, including $5 and a pork chop sandwich, vote buying and the corruption of democracy. We are who we say we are, a black family search for home across the Atlantic world. Power in words, the story behind Barack Obama's speeches from the State House to the White House with Josh Kothemeyer and Justice for All, the United States Commission on Civil Rights and the Struggle for Freedom in America, and the book we'll be discussing today, My Face is Black is True, Cali House and the Struggle for Ex-Slave Reparations. We'd also like to welcome Dr. V.P. Franklin, an distinguished professor emeritus of history and education at the University of California, Riverside, from 2001 to 2018, he served as the editor of the Journal of African American History, the leading scholarly publication on African American life and history, formerly the Journal of Negro History. During his editorship, the journal's articles received awards for excellence in scholarly research from five national and international historical organizations. During the 2005, 2004 to 2005 school year, Dr. Franklin held the Fulbright Commission's Uppsala Chair in American Studies at the Swedish Institute for North American Studies at Uppsala University, Sweden. Between September 2000 and August 2002, he was the Rosa and Charles Keller Professor of Arts and Humanities at Xavier University in Louisiana. We'd also like to give a great welcome to Dr. Robert Saint to Dr. Robert Saint Martin Wesley, joined, who joined the Tulane faculty in two thousand. Sorry, in nineteen ninety five, after completing his PhD in philosophy, his dissertation topic was Fourth Amendment jurisprudence, race, and the rights of groups. While at Yale, Professor Wesley was a recipient of the Mellon Foundation Fellowship in Humanity. After receiving his PhD, he served as president's postdoctoral fellow at the University of California, San Diego. Let me see, there, there seems to be some backdrop. Let me uh, mute everyone, sorry for that. Uh, his research and teaching interests are in the fields of critical race theory, constitutional law, philosophy of law and the legal profession. In 1997, he chaired the ninth annual critical race theory workshop, a working meeting of young legal scholars addressing issues concerning communities of color. The workshop was held at Tulane. He is a former member of the board of governors of the Society of American Law Teachers. We'd also like to give a great welcome to brother Cam Howard, who is a national and international reparations scholar and activist 
working for over 20 years building grassroots movements to obtain reparations for African descendants in the United States. From 2006 to 2022, he served as the national co-chair of the National Coalition of Blacks for Reparations in America. While at Cobra, he assisted in forming the vision and developed, led and implemented many significant actions pushing forward and keeping alive the fight for redress and repair for the intergenerational harm inflicted on Black people and the anti-Black policy sanctioned by local, state, and federal governments affecting us to this day. In 2022, Howard founded the Reparations, founded Reparations United to further his mission for obtaining reparations he provides advisory and leadership to coalition and activists in the movement. Currently, he serves as a commissioner, commissioner of the National African American Reparations Commission, where he led in revising the federal legislation, H.R. 40, a bill to establish a commission to study and develop reparation proposals for African Americans. And I'm not sure if he has joined us yet or will be able to join us this evening, but we'd also like to welcome Dr. Raymond Wimbush, a research professor and the director of the Institute for Urban Research. As a scholar and activist, he is known for his systems thinking approaches to understanding the impact of racism, white supremacy on the global African community. His writings, consultations and research have been instrumental in understanding developmental studies in black males, public policy and its connection to the compensatory justice relationships between black males and females, infusion of African studies into school curricula, and the impact of hip hop culture on the contemporary American landscape. He is author of Should America Pay? Slavery and the Raging Debate on Reparation. So a huge welcome to all of our panelists tonight. They've all done a tremendous work and moved the uh, movement for reparations forward through their narrative building. And so now I'd like to call our first speaker, Brother Cam Howard. Greetings, Sister Jam, and thank you and Sister Nkichi for this opportunity to share tonight uh, with these very distinguished panel of authors. Uh, it's, it's quite a pleasure, thank you. So the, the, look, the pamphlet that I wrote is not a, a book uh, in, the, in the general sense, but a pamphlet. It was written as entitled Land and Foundation for Local Reparations, a National Guide for Providing Symmetry in the Local Reparations Movement. It was written out of dire necessity. In 2019, uh, November 2019, Alderman Robin Simmons uh, passed the first local municipal uh, citywide reparations uh, legislation. And at that point, she was getting tons and tons of questions around local reparations. Uh, many people were saying local reparations was not reparations, it was fake reparations. Uh, it was hurting the federal. Uh, push for reparations. If it is local rep reparations, what makes it local reparations? What makes it reparations? And many other questions. And we, she was she would call me constantly. We would talk constantly, uh, and I would try to help her to answer these questions. At the same time, I was uh, leading an effort in Chicago to push a local reparations initiative. And in June of 2020, we uh, we were, we passed in Chicago a local reparations initiative. So that really made me. Uh, focus on really writing the, the book, the pamphlet. Uh, again, she wanted to have something that she could refer to that she could you know, legitimize uh, some of her responses. And so that was really the impetus for writing it. Along with, I was working with about a half a dozen cities. She was working with about a dozen cities at the time. And shortly after the book was written, or I started writing in Asheville, uh, subsequently passed, um, their reparations, local reparations initiative. And I had been working with Asheville as well. And so there were a lot of questions uh, from a lot of different people from all around the world, all around the uh, country, who were looking at trying to implement what Evanston had done. Uh, how do they start? What type of, is there a toolkit? Is there you know, anything written? And so uh, that's really what inspired me to write the book. I wanted to answer these the major questions that were being asked uh, over and over. Is it what makes the reparations? What legitimizes the reparations? Is local reparations actually reparations? What's the foundation or basis for making a demand at the local level? And so we uh, put this pamphlet together to answer those questions. And the question is broken down in um, those particular uh, areas. Uh, 
what is the foundation of reparations. Uh, we, I, I indicated that uh, I was using NARC's requirement for reparations, local reparations. Uh, right now, there's about seven requirements, but at the time, there was three. One is that the injuring parties could not determine what was reparations. It had to be determined by those who were injured. Uh, these states and municipalities and corporations, whoever, uh, in, th in this case, the municipalities cannot determine what was reparations. That was number one. Number two is that the injured parties also had to be re those responsible for distributing reparations. Some type of structure had to be put in place like a stakeholders group uh, or a commission that was established by uh, the residents to determine actually how those reparations were being distributed. And then finally, it, couldn't been, it could not have been ordinary uh, legislation, ordinary public policy. It had to specifically be targeted toward uh, people of African descent who suffer specific injury from location, local municipalities, and the resources was targeted directly toward redressing or repairing that, that particular harm those, to that specific group of people. And so that was the three major requirements uh, for which local reparations had to be had to fulfill. The second question, major question, was would local reparations harm federal reparations? Because a lot of people were saying it was not only was it fake reparations, you couldn't call it reparations, but um, would it harm our federal push? And so in, in answering the question, was it actually reparations, I, I suggested that any resources, no matter how large or how small, targeted towards specific crimes that we endured, no matter how large or how small, was in fact reparations. And the example, you know, see people who were saying it was fake reparations were saying that reparations is not reparations unless it um, addresses the racial wealth gap. Well, that's one aspect of reparations. That's one particular continued impact, uh, the racial wealth gap that we suffer from as a result of the crimes committed against us. But there's a whole host of injury and impact that we suffer from. And I gave the example that in one regards, our cultural identity is part of the, the injury that we suffer. And a DNA, a DNA test to determine uh, where we come from on the continent of Africa is a form of reparations. Uh, it doesn't uh, attempt to address the racial wealth gap. It attempts to address the crime against our knowledge of self uh, that was also a, a harmful impact of the transatlantic slave trade. And the DNA test is about $350, $400. So if this government was to apply every person who wanted uh, a DNA test, that is in fact reparations, but it does not uh, address any other harm than that of the cultural harm of that, that, that we suffer from the loss of identity, cultural identity. And so we wanted to point out what exactly is reparations because there was a misconception. And then whether or not it would harm uh, the federal push for reparations. We said that local reparations had three primary purposes or four if you break it down. The first purpose was to uh, act as a form of triage. And triage is a situation where you have a, a dire emergency and you have limited resources. How do you direct these limited resources in the best way to help uh, as many people as possible in the, in the most significant need that they have? And the local reparations, you, know, you don't have a whole lot of resources at the local level. The, the, the type of resources needed to address the multitude, multitude of injury that we suffer from, uh, the three periods of crimes committed against us must come from the federal government. But we can target some limited resources toward one or two areas at a time uh, that would have significant impact on some of the injury that we face as a, as a people. And so we, our expectations had to be clear that local reparations was limited and it was uh, really a form of triage. The second purpose was to actually propel and fuel the push for the federal uh, bill. And we looked at, and I gave the example of the uh, desegregation of, of public schools in this country started at the local level. Uh, the Brown versus uh, the Board of Education to Topeka, Kansas. That was a local uh, effort. And there was uh, quite a few local efforts that were happening around desegregation of schools. And that particular case went to the Supreme Court and, and, and eventually led to the desegregation of schools in this country. The ban the box around asking, have you been federally convicted of or convicted of a crime? That's another piece of legislation. It's a federal law, but it started at the local level. We can give example after example after example. 
So we say local reparations, in fact, fills the push for, for federal reparations. It does not harm our federal reparations at all. And then finally, local reparations was to provide structures to direct and receive resources once they come down from the federal level and to provide actu actual plans that have been tested at the local level and that needed to be scaled up. And so those we said was the purposes of local reparations. And then uh, we talked about in this pamphlet, the various models of reparations, local reparations. The Evanston model was a unique model where they first uh, assign after establishing commission, they assign uh, a set amount of resources. And then they, the third thing they did was to set about, set aside the processes, determine how they were gonna distribute those resources. In the HR 40 model, the model is the first create a commission, second to determine the degree of injury and the proposals to address that injury. And then third is was to, we would have to fund those resources, fund those initiatives. Uh, Jam, I see you came in. How am I fixed on time? You have about one more minute. <laughs> one more minute. That's good. I'm good. I'm good with that one minute. So, uh, so we looked at the models, and then finally, I wanted to uh, address the issue of what do we base our rep local reparations demand on? So in Chicago, we use uh, three areas: we use genocide, we use plunder, and we use apartheid. Uh, genocide. Kinkichi gave a great intervention today at the conference showing telling about the five components of genocide not just killing people in, in whole but in part creating conditions that lead to their death creating conditions that lead to mental uh harm to individuals all these and some others all these were forms of genocide and they're happening right down in almost every black community in america and we had a, a sister that gave a tremendous amount of data to demonstrate genocide Plunder, I had an elder white man who worked with Tony Easy Coates when he did his article, The Case for Reparations, who charted the $4 billion plundered from the Chicago community from 1950 to 1970 during the contract buying scheme, and another $4 billion plundered from the city of Chicago, Black Chicagoans, with the predatory lending scheme. And then finally, I talked about apartheid. Anywhere you have uh, differences, everywhere you have uh, 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 racial differences, you find evidence of apartheid in the form of separate development resources targeted to one community that was not targeted to another, or resources uh, withheld from a community that was not withheld from others. And you get these racial disparities, these wide gulfs in almost every area of life in these cities, and that's, that's direct evidence of apartheid. So local communities can make the demand uh, for reparations in any one or all three of these areas as we did in Chicago. And we wanted to make sure that anyone who wanted to engage in local reparations would have the at least a, a framework in which to do so. And we've influenced a few, several dozen cities. Uh, almost every city that has a reparations initiative active have a, someone on that, in that uh, city has uh, and is doing that work has read this pamphlet. So uh, it, it was born out of necessity. And if I was to write it today, it would probably be five times longer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Cam. And anyone that has any questions for Cam Howard, please put them in the Q&A box button. And when we get to that section, um, we'll be able to answer, we'll get all our panelists to answer questions. Now we'd love to hear from Dr. Mary Frances Berry. Uh, the floor is yours. I thought we were having Nick T.T. next because she said she was worried about the internet. We're not having her. Okay. I, I'm good. I misheard. All right. Let me just say that uh, I wanted to give uh, Cam my uh, time because it was so interesting what he was saying. But uh, it would seem to me that uh, the argument about one of the things we have to stop doing is having arguments about you know, should there be local, national wealth gap reparations for your soul? You, well, I mean, there's a both end proposition, not you either got to do this or you got to do that. And then we got to fight with each other about it. It doesn't do anybody any good. Uh, Kelly House, uh, who I wrote about in a book that came out, I think hardcover was 2004. Um, was a uh, black woman from Tennessee, Washington woman, former slave who I became fascinated with when I heard about 
what she had done because I didn't believe it in the first place. I said, that's ridiculous. How could she do all of that to the guy who was telling me about her? Uh, she was born, we think, in 1861. And that's because anybody Black who was born at that time, you have to guess, but they think she was, she thinks she was born, she thought she was born in 1861, and her relatives all had these dates when they thought they were born. Uh, I have some people in my family like that. I don't know if any of you do. But in any case, she died in 1928. And in between, she was a washerwoman. She had five children that she raised uh, after her husband died, who was a laborer. Her mother had been a washerwoman. And uh, so she uh, she uh, was doing the same thing her mother did. And she was a widow then. And she heard about the idea of pensions because, you know, we didn't have Social Security. When she was at church and there was a white guy who was trying to do this promotion scam where he got black people to sign up for uh, or to say that they supported him and contribute money. And then he would get a bill from the Congress, he said, and was going to give them some kind of pensions or reparations, which he never did. But he did take a bill, some bills to the Congress, and they were laid on the table. Anyway, after she re uh, read it, she went to school because she went to one of the local freedmen schools and she learned about the Constitution and she learned how to read and write. So she knew about protest. And so she decided that she told a, a guy who was from there who had been working with this white man, Isaac Dickinson, why do we have to talk with him? Why don't we set up something ourselves <laughs> and do something about this issue? We could do that. I learned about the Constitution. You're supposed to be able to petition your government. Uh, and why can't, why do we have to get him? We don't know what he's doing anyway. And so she, um, they uh, joined forces and uh, they set up this um, uh, organization, the Ex-Slave Pension. They called it the Ex-Slave uh, Pension Movement. But the interesting thing about it is, there's a lot of interesting about it, is one, a lot of men who I talked to, some in my own family, say that she couldn't have done that. That guy, Dickerson, must have did it because she was a woman. They wouldn't let her do anything like that at the time. So why do you keep saying she did something? Uh, and the unfortunate thing is he worked with her for a while, and he was very effective and was very supportive, but he died. So I keep telling them that if he died... <laughs> How can you keep telling me that I ought to say that he did everything? And some of them still do it. I go to places where I give talks and somebody get up and say, that man, Isaac Dickinson, did all of that. This black woman, she was just probably going with him or something. <laughs> you know, why are you saying that? Anyway, uh, these bills, uh, they collected dues, uh, 25 cents a year, if anybody had any money. Uh, she traveled all around the country. Her children were old enough that the oldest ones could take care of the youngest ones. And she went places and she would sit and listen to people. That's the thing that built the movement, because she would go to churches and she would sit after the service and everything else and listen to people talk for hours about how they felt and what had happened to them and how they got over and all the rest. So people knew who she was and they felt that she was interested in them. They set up chapters. And there's a key thing about it. They didn't ask for local um, uh, reparations, but they had a mutual assistance program in every chapter. Every chapter had to. That was a fundamental part of the program. Take care of its own. Raise some money for barren people. To, uh, you got sick. Uh, raise some money to try to help people. Sit with people. Just rotate. Who's you going to sit with somebody who is mourning and who is in trouble? But it had, and these chapters continued long after she was, uh, after she died, after she was in jail and died. This chapter was very successful. The federal government said uh, that uh, they had 300,000 dues paying members. I tell people, they didn't say it. The federal government, when they got ready to get rid of her, said, this woman is dangerous. She's running the Negroes wild. She's going around telling them that if they work hard and they, she send these lawyers up here with their money to put these proposals in, that someday they might get some money, some pensions, and like the veterans do, if they can actually get them. But she, they said, when the Negroes find out, I had this quote in the book, that they're not getting anything, then we're going to have some trouble on our hands. 
<laughs> so we got to stop her. She's, you know, she's just running them wild. And so they decided that they wanted to. They issued an order that she couldn't use the mails to send out the flyers or the notices or anything else. Um, and uh, then she had to travel more. And she used uh, Pony Express or whatever it was, that express thing that they had then. Uh, it wasn't Federal Express. And that cost money, trying to send the flyers and the mail and everything to all the churches and all the places and the traveling. And then when they didn't stop, they decided to prosecute her. So they prosecuted her for using the mails to defraud. Convicted her in the court in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, all white jury, as you would expect, federal court. And they convicted her of using the mail to defraud. What did she do? It was very simple. They said in the court, at a time when she should have known the federal government was never going to give Negroes anything, she was going around organizing Negroes to try to get some. <laughs> and that's fraud. Because she was smart enough. She had gone and read. She knew about the Constitution and all that. She was always talking about it. She should have told them, the federal government's never going to give you anything. <laughs> and she encouraged them. And they got 300,000 dues-paying members. There were members. I tell people this. They don't, they don't, some people don't believe me. They had members, had members all over the country. Anywhere there were Negroes, they had members. They had, when I was on the board of the Garvey Papers, we put them together. The list we had of the members of the Garvey chapters, some of them came out of the ex slave pension movement. Queen Mother Moore was in the chapter in New Orleans. So that people who, this is, there's a continuity uh, to this thing. But the uh, prosecutor put her in prison. Um, uh, I have a friend who's a lobbyist. He said, if you can put people in prison for going up to tell the Congress to try to get them to do something they don't want to do, I'd be in prison. <laughs> Because that's what I do. I get paid <laughs> to go up there and try to get the Congress to do something they don't want to do. Uh, but in any case, when she got out of uh, prison, she ended up um, she ended up getting sick. She got uh, cancer, um, um, and she uh, died untreated. The doctor said she bled to death. But um, in Nashville, and they always said that the feds did that she had a lot of money. She lived in a shotgun house in Nashville down there where the Gulch is. It was right in the neighborhood where I grew up as a poverty-stricken child stumbling around. Um, and now it's got a housing project. Uh, then the Gulch is down there. But uh, she died. Uh, and after she died, the I found chapters still functioning. There was a chapter in Atlanta. They met, they took care of the mutual assistance. They kept trying to get some kind of pension or something. So they were true to it. And the members, as I said, flowed into the Garvey movement and took the cause from there. Now, the important thing about this, there's a lot of important about it, that you can do anything if you will just do everything you can to do anything, which is what she did. <laughs> she put herself out there, okay? Because she believed in it and she wanted to do it that uh, there's continuity in the reparation struggle in this country. I don't know much about what people are doing in other countries, but in this country, there's great continuity. And we can go all the way back and come up, but from her to try to get the federal government, which is what she was trying to do overall to get a bill to pass. And the other thing is, is they used uh, uh, tactics that are tried and true for organizing. And also they didn't give up, <laughs> you see. The thing about her sitting and talking with people you know, and listening to people and their stories, people love it when you listen to what they have to say and you respond to them. I do that myself. I spend hours listening to people when I go somewhere to speak, letting them tell me their story so I can bond with them and try to shed some light on so that they go away strengthened uh, and that I'm not just there to just tell them whatever I got to tell them now. Uh, this book, I'm not supposed to tell you why I wrote it or anything. I'm supposed to wait till they ask me the questions. So I will do it. But I think the importance of it is that I wrote it uh, in part because John O. Franklin and I was sitting talking about uh, it after a labor union a guy in, uh, in Detroit told me about it at a reception. 
He said, there's some woman down there from Tennessee and a black labor guy on the line with me says she started some kind of movement to get pensions for black people. You from Nashville, don't you know about her? And I didn't know anything about her. So I started trying to find her. He didn't know anything else about her. I knew she existed. And the whole domain of history and talking about what we've done and undone and not done, nobody knew anything. John Hope said, I'd never heard. And he said, nobody I know who's a historian has ever heard of this woman. It's about time she got reclaimed and lifted up and let people see what she did and see the example that she set. And I think that she still sets an example. She could distinguish things. Uh, keep in mind that Kelly House didn't know what the federal government was saying about her. I read all the papers when I went and did the research in the archives. She didn't know that the Pension Bureau had said she's driving the Negroes wild. She didn't know that they had sent surveillance teams around to her meetings to see if she was doing anything really funky. She didn't know that because it's all in the files. Nobody. She kept writing these letters, which I report in the uh, book, saying, what are people trying to do? All I'm trying to do is to get us something. And she talked about the old people and the worn out people and everybody. And she said, I don't understand. I, I thought I read the Constitution. I got the right to petition you. And they just, they were laughing at her. Uh, and so that's her story. And I will be, uh, and that's important. All, everything I've said, I think, is important for the kind of movement we have today. The last thing I'll say is that we do need new, we need more narratives about reparations and different angles to use because in the United States, the national movement for a national bill is, of course, you can tell yourself lagging. <laughs> Everything else is sort of overcome and overtaken what is going on. My own view is that in the last election, we dropped the ball and didn't push it because everybody kept telling me, shut up talking about that. Did we trying to win the election? <laughs> I said, but if we win the election, then what are we going to do? No, just shut up talking about that. Just we, Let's just win the election. Once we get the election, and I've been around too long and written too much and done too much research to know that winning the election is the beginning. It's not the end <laughs> of anything. And that we as Black people have been fooled so many times well, we think, I wrote a chapter in Long Memory that I wrote with John Blessing on. I said, Blacks in the Politics of Redemption. How Black people think that if you just vote, voting is important, but you just vote, everything is going to be fine. Because people tell us that, especially if you vote for them. But we should have kept pushing and we should have pushed and made commitments come from those people who are running Biden and all the rest of them uh, in the campaign and pushed it from there. And we should do it this time. But we need narratives because public opinion, as you know, shows that lots of folks in the United States don't even understand or don't believe or don't care <laughs> that we need reparations. So I think that uh, narratives, I'm writing another book, but I'll tell talk about that when somebody asks me a question. Thank you. I'm sure I took more time than I should have. Thank you so much, Dr. Barry. It was very enlightening to hear about your research on Cali House and definitely going to hear more in the uh, Q&A. Um, so next, we would love to welcome Dr. V.P. Franklin. And if you have any questions for Dr. Barry, please put them in the Q&A box. Oh, good evening, everyone. I'm really, really happy for this opportunity to uh, participate in this panel and to uh, tell you about the forthcoming volume that Dr. Mary Frances Berry and I and Dr. Sundiata uh, Kwajua at the University of Illinois have uh, put together and that will be published uh, in 2024. Uh, as was mentioned, I was editor of the Journal of African American History uh, when Dr. Berry's book uh, Cali, on Cali House, My Face is Black is True, came out. And it was just so much new information about the reparations movement that we, at first, we had a symposium on the book uh, at the annual meeting of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. And then we had a, uh, 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 a special, I uh, had a symposium published in the Journal of African American History in 2006. 
And so for me, that uh, opened up the issue of reparations. And I said that this is something that should be pursued uh, in the Journal of African-American History uh, be beyond the symposium on Dr. Barry's new book, wonderful new information, all of this. And so in 2009, I issued a call for papers for a special issue of the Journal of African-American History on uh, the history of the reparations movement for African-Americans. And the, and, and the response was very, very positive. And in, indeed, the first person to send a uh, uh, contribution of, for this special issue was Dr. Ron Walters, John Wal Walters, who had published articles and books, et cetera, on reparations movement, not just in the United States, but in South Africa as well. And he submitted a, a manuscript for that special issue. And others began to come in on that, on, um, on various aspects of the reparations movement, including uh, including a movement that took place, a uh, uh, reparations movement that took place around the same time as Callie House and uh, Isaiah Dickinson's movement and stuff. So the Journal of African American History uh, special issue came out in 2012, uh, African Americans and Movements for Reparations, Past, Present, and Future. So that was the Journal of African American History in winter uh, spring That's issue. Ron of Walters on the picture. Pardon That's me? Ron Walters. That's Ron Walters on the picture. Ron Walters, right. Who, who did I put his picture on the back of the journal, but you didn't say who it was. Yes, he's pictured uh, Ron Walters. His picture is on the cover of the special issue. And then uh, and uh, the uh, when the CARICOM Commission in 2013-2014 was set up, uh, in the uh, by the various nations in the in in the Caribbean, when that was was taking place, you had uh, Dr. Ron Daniels uh, issuing a call and creating a some having a summit meeting between the CARICOM leaders and African American leaders in the United States who were interested in reparations, and then Dr. Ron Walter uh, uh, Ron Daniels. Who was the who is the president of the Institute for the Black World 21st Century held the summit in New York City in 2015. And the and and the this summit uh was extremely important in making the connection between the reparations campaigns that were taking place in the Caribbean, but also in uh, in Africa and and in and in Europe as well as the United States, and the the issue then continued to bubble. And he created the National African American Reparations Commission. Uh, I was he would ask me to join that commission, and so I was a member and participated in the various town hall meetings that were held uh, by the National African American Reparations Commission and various lo local groups. For example, there was a town hall meeting in 2016 in Atlanta. I participated in that, that NARC uh, founded. Uh, there was an, another uh, town hall meeting founded by NARC in 2017 that was held in New Orleans and I helped organize that. And so, and so but also the international movement was growing and I participated in with uh, Dr. Mary Frances Berry was, was unable to attend, but she delivered a paper at that international meeting that took place in 2014 at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. And on the basis of, uh, on the basis of that uh, international meeting on reparations, uh, the Journal of African American issued a special issue that was published in the winter spring issue of 2018 on national and international reparations movements. And so, uh, so that, and then, so, so this uh, uh, movement, national and international movement, served and the articles and the interest that was developing. Uh, uh, not just in the United States, but in various parts of the world, uh, was was growing and expanding, and uh, and 
Dr. Barry and uh, Professor uh, Sundiata Chajua said, oh, okay, but what about disseminating, putting out that information that is taking place in these various meetings, these various activities that are taking place around the world to that would sort of bring together the national and the international, but also would deal, would provide information on various approaches and aspects of this emerging national and international reparations movement. And so Dr. Barry and I and Professor Chajua at uh, the University of Illinois have put together a volume that will be published by the University of Illinois Press in uh, 2020, the spring of 2024. The volume, Reparations and Reparatory Justice, Past, Present, and Future, uh, will include uh, a timeline on the history of reparations movement with a bibliography that can, that people who are interested in these articles and books on the reparations movement. And then it also includes uh, the call that introduced the International and National Reparations Summit that Dr. Ron Daniels held in New York City in 2015. So we have that statement from Dr. Ron Daniels that lit that uh, uh, call together, that summit that took place in 2015. We have uh, Reverend Jeff Jesse Jackson participated in NARC's uh, summit meeting in 2015. And we have the speech, the speech that Reverend Jesse Jackson gave at the in national international summit in New York City in 2015. So we have Reverend uh, Jesse Jackson's speech from that from that meeting. We also have uh, the speech that was given by Danny Glover, Danny, the actor Danny Glover, who participated in the town hall meeting in Atlanta, and he participated in the town hall, Narc's town hall meeting in New Orleans. And the speech that Danny Glover gave in New Orleans in 2017 is included in this volume. Danny Glover has been a, been a major participant and social activist in the reparations movement and other movements for social justice. And he talks about personally, talks about how the reparations movement fulfills the uh, his things that happened to him that he understood from, as a, from his family, from from his growing up in in California and how the uh, conditions the conditions that under which black people were lived have have had to live were need to be addressed that need to be redressed and so Danny Glover talked personally about how important the reparations movement was is to him and so we have his speech from uh, the meeting in 2017 here in New Orleans. We have an article by the journalist uh, Earl Ofari Hutchinson on 10 reasons why the reparations issues is so important. We have, and, and of course we have the revised version of, the, uh, uh, of uh, Congressman John Conyers who had been introducing H.R. 40 into Congress beginning in 1989. And then that campaign for passage of H.R. 40 was taken up by Sheila Jackson Lee. And NARC and, and COBRA worked with her to revise it and update H.R. 40. And that revised and updated version of H.R. 40 that passed, that was passed the Judicial Commi Committee uh, in 2021, that that uh, document, the bill itself is included in our volume uh, as well, and an introduction by Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee. We also have uh, Cam Howard, who you've heard from, uh, who discusses the uh, the importance of some of the issues that he discussed today, this this evening, as well as the. Uh, the uh, crimes against humanity that have taken place over the over the last four hundred years, and how all of that lays the it serves as the basis for the reparations movement uh, to uh, today. 
We and then internationally, we have uh, Sir Hilary Beckles, who is the chair of CARICOM Reparations Commission, and he gave a speech at the United Nations in 2015 as part of the kicking off of the uh, uh, decade of people of African descent. He gave a speech at the United Nations support, making it very clear why this reparations movement is important given the situation for African peoples over the last 400 years, not just in uh, the Caribbean, but th in Africa and throughout the world. So we have, uh, so we have that speech from uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Hen uh, Hillary Beckles. We also have the uh, uh, <clears throat> the reparations plan, the ten point program that the National Association for Africa National Association for Reparations Commission has come up with as a blueprint for how what should be take place, what should be included in the HR forty when HR forty is implemented, and the areas that it should address. The ten ten point program issued by NARC. We have that included. We have, and then we have scholarly articles, including an article by Mary Frances Berry that focuses in on something that she mentioned in her in her Cali House book, but but provides more details on it. And this is this is this is an article uh called Taking the United States to Court, Cali House and the 1915 Cotton Tax Reparations Litigation. And so Dr. Mary Berry uh, uh, documents how Cali House sued the United States government and, and tried to get the government to use the funds that were collected by the federal government from Southern, from southern plantation owners uh, that were growing cotton and they used these funds from the sale of cotton to be used as a pension plan for African Americans. And so that article is in there. Then we have another article on the uh, socialist case for reparations. There was a debate between Ta-Nehisi Coates and Senator Barry, Barry uh, uh, Sanders about uh, whether or not uh, rep socialists should be supporting reparations movement. Well, we have, a, we have that debate uh, discussed and in the article by uh, Brian Jones, of a uh, well-known socialist in the United Professor. States. Well, Professor, we, we, we need to, um, we want to make sure we have enough time for Q&A, so we just want to go on. Okay, and then Sundi Ali Chajua's article on the specific uh, political and economic demands that are associated with the reparations movement. We have a, a we have an article by political scientist uh, Charles Henry on the on uh, reparations for for African Americans who were not necessarily enslaved but were at the same time victimized by various forms of, of oppression. And then we have a discussion. And then I have an article on reparations and reparatory justice movements in the 21st century. So uh, reparations and reparatory justice, past, present, and future will be published by the University of Illinois Press in 2020, spring of 2024. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Franklin. Um, if you have any questions for him, please put them in the Q&A. Um, we'd now like to welcome Dr. Robert Wesley. Also reminding speakers, seven minutes, please, if you can. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna do my best. Thank you so much for having me. I really truly feel honored to be in this company. Um, I don't know if Dr. Barry remembered me from many years ago when she was uh, an invited speaker at Tulane uh, Law School in New Orleans. Um, but I really appreciate her, her contribution to the discourse. Um, and it's sort of, out to dinner. Um, yeah, you took me to, out to dinner, didn't you? Absolutely. To Antoine's, Absolutely. I think. Absolutely. We did. When I'm in New Orleans, can you take me again? <laughs> <laughs> I'd be honored to do that. <laughs> okay. Thank, thank you. you so much. Um, but yeah, no, uh, I, I'm, I, I really, uh, appreciate her her contribution 
because um, it it takes a historical approach, and that's something that that I found was important in my own work. And I also appreciate uh, how um, Dr. Franklin talked about um, the the Cali House um, in terms of the litigation effort because I'm a I'm a lawyer I'm a law professor and so I kind of look at the issue of reparations through that lens through the lens of um, of its litigation history and um, I feel um, a little bit um, overwhelmed by the fact that my my um, my book hasn't come out yet. Uh, so I'm in the company of people who are actually already published authors, and so I, I feel a little bit intimidated by that. But I, I'm hopeful that my book will be coming out um, in uh, in 2024. I'm I'm actually very close to to the end. Um, the I so I even have a title at this point. The title is is dismissed with prejudice. The enduring quest. For black reparations under the law, oh. and and um, and of course I mean this dismissed with prejudice in both a legal sense and an ordinary language sense, right? That this is you know because when I got involved with reparations when I was still a law student, um, you couldn't really talk about it with. With, with people who weren't movement people because it was so misunderstood, so reviled, um, just so rejected out of hand. So it's it's really, you know, kind of stunning to me how well accepted reparations is at this point that, um, that Sister Taifa could write a book about reparations on fire, right? So that, you know, it's something that's, beginning to happen and through the efforts of, of folks like like um, by folks like Cam Howard it's it's really happening at the local level even though of course we all are waiting for that grand bargain moment when the federal government steps up and does what it really should have done a long time ago. So I do take a historical approach. If there was a historical figure that um, that I would say guides my trajectory, it would it would probably be um, Solomon Northrup. Um, you know, when I was in the midst of writing my book, um, I came across his uh, autobiography, uh, Twelve Years a Slave, and um, and I actually read the book waiting for the moment when he would get compensated for what happened to him. And of course, he would never be compensated for what happened to him in the first place because he couldn't even testify against the white men who kidnapped him. So, um, <clears throat> because he was a black man. And so, you know, I mean, that's for me, looking at slavery has always been an important piece of the reparation puzzle. And so, you know, because there was a time when people would say, well, let's, you know, slavery so long ago, let's just deal with the with the with the crimes of Jim Crow. It was bad enough under Jim Crow, and that's more recent, and we still have these living victims. And so, you know, I was like, well, <laughs> I never bought that argument. I never I just never did because I just kept waiting for the success. And especially the success for those people who happened to survive what happened in, in Tulsa. Um, you know, and of course what we know is that, you know, these, these survivors who are over a hundred years old now, um, just brought, uh, were just had their case thrown out of court. And unlike more recent, um, reparations litigation, where the courts were dismissing these cases on the grounds of sovereign immunity or um, on the ground of, of standing, you have no standing to represent your ancestors. Um, 
what they did in this case was they dismissed with prejudice. 100-year-old survivors, and they dismissed their case with prejudice, not without prejudice, so that they could bring the case back. Because with prejudice as a legal standard means that you can't bring it back. Case over. We've decided on the merits, you're done. Whereas if it's without prejudice, as most of the contemporary cases have been, they can, they say there's a procedural defect and we just, you just need to fix that procedural defect and you can bring it back at some other point. And of course, as a statute of limitations is, was always one of those defects. What the law tells us is that legislatures establish statutes of limitation and legislatures can eliminate them. So it's a matter of whether or not they really want to have the discussion. You know, I'm not really a movement activist as, as an academic. I'm much more of a reparations theorist. So I look at how do we use a system which was set up to ensure that we don't get justice, how do we use it to get justice? And, you know, and for me, part of the answer is a comparative approach. Look at the successful reparations cases and figure out what can we learn from those cases um, that we can use in our case to get what we deserve. So that's part of the impetus behind my book, which is to sort of respond to those who say it's too late, um, that uh, we should only focus on Jim Crow. They're not giving anything for Jim Crow. So it seems to me, why give up slavery? Um, and, and, and it's also to say, you know, let's look at this from a legal standpoint and a comparative standpoint. We can't be afraid of that. The longest chapter in my book is a chapter on continuing racial harm. And it can, it can only be, you know, like just, Justice Jackson's dissent in the affirmative action case, it can only be representative of a small portion of what you could actually include because the story can't be told in one sitting. There's so many layers there. So I just, I, I just wanted to open that up so that people could understand that there's a lot more to learn about the, the, the need, not only the need, but the, but the, but the justification and the right to reparation that they may know at the moment. So I'm, I'm going to try to stay within the, the seven minutes. <laughs> Restriction of, lights flashing. The lights flashing. There's lots more that I would I have to say that I would love to say, um, but I also want to hear from other folks. Thank you so much, Dr. Wesley. Um, and now, and, and if anyone has any questions for him, please put it in the Q and A. I'm not sure if we're going to get to all these questions because we got a lot, and we had some questions already set up, so I'm gonna have to figure that out. But um, we're also happy to welcome Dr. Raymond Wimbush. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks a lot. I'm a little hoarse from speaking all over the place in the past week. Um, you know, in seven minutes, I want to talk about a sister uh, that I wrote a book about, uh, Belinda Royale Sutton. Uh, I had just, I was finishing up uh, Should America Pay in the early 2000s. And right when I was browsing through some microfiche and in the Boston area, I saw this, you know, column in a newspaper that said, uh, uh, Petition of Belinda. And I had heard about Rita Duff's poem about Belinda. I don't know if you've ever read that, but the poet, she wrote a poem about, and when I saw Belinda, I said, that sounds like a sister. And, and it was a sister, uh, Belinda, uh, at that time, Belinda Royale. And so um, I told myself after I edited Should America Pay, I was never going to edit another book in my life. It was kind of like, 
herding rabbits or something like that with all the people that we did. I, I, that's a whole nother discussion about uh, should America pay. But anyway, I started digging. I told my uh, editor at HarperCollins I had discovered this system named Belinda uh, Royale and that I wanted to write another chapter in Should America Pay about it. And she said, well, we got to meet the deadline for publication. And uh, Mary, I'm sure all of y'all know about deadlines with editors. So I said, I'm going to write a separate <laughs> book about it. And I did, which was called Belinda's Petition. Belinda was his sister that in 1712. She was captured in Ghana. And, uh, and again, Mary, you know, the idea of us needing uh, narratives is very important in reparation. It's very important. Um, she was captured in 1712. And if you read her petition, uh, which is still extant uh, up in Massachusetts, she says, uh, the men who captured me had faces like the moon. And she was talking about white folks. And a lot of people think that Belinda was captured in Ghana and taken directly to the United States. But she was uh, captured and taken to Antigua in the Caribbean. And Isaac Royale actually had a plantation in Antigua, and he also had a plantation on what is now the campus of Tufts University, right outside of Boston. And there was a enslavement rebellion uh, on Antigua. And to be honest, you know, uh, Isaac Royale was scared, and he took Belinda and several other enslaved Africans by ship, of course, up to uh, the Ten Hills Plantation, again, which was on the campus of Tufts University. And there, uh, Belinda languished for, as she says in the petition, for 50 years of unpaid labor. Isaac Royale, and see, this is how there's so many connections uh, to, you know, modern day stuff. Isaac Royale gave the first endowment for what is now the uh, College of Law at Harvard University. In fact, there was a controversy there a few years ago uh, because the endowed chair was named after him and he, uh, he was an enslaver. So uh, Belinda, you know, toiled there for 50 years, as she says in her petition. And at the outbreak of the American uh, Revolutionary War, Isaac Royale fled the country, went up to Canada to the Royalists because he was supporting the British and he had a price on his head. And he left Belinda as well as 50 other enslaved Africans on the plantation all by themselves, which was a big mistake. So um, she was illiterate. In fact, I've seen the original petition at the bottom of the petition. It is very well written in longhand there's a big X uh, for Belinda's signature. And come to find out that one of two people wrote the petition for her. Uh, it was either uh, Primus Hall or a sister by the name of Phyllis Wheatley, who lived not far from there and is buried, uh, in fact, next to Al or near Alexander Hamilton and been I forget the name of that cemetery, but I, I'm going to say something else about it as I uh, bring this to a close. So Belinda, I mean, the petition should be read, and I included the entire thing in my book. Uh, the petition is just so poetic. And I, I'm sure, I always think that uh, Phyllis Wheatley uh, wrote it for her because she was a poet. and But it talks about the meanness of white people who captured her and her voyage on the ship that took her to Antigua, and all of this. And then uh, when when Isaac Royal, who actually wrote it, I mean, who was up in Canada at this time, read it, uh, he said he didn't understand why Belinda was angry at him for asking for reparation. You know, as if one human being can, you know, own another and you not be angry about it. And so he um, 
just was dis. I mean, if you read his letter in response to the petition, he was actually like, I can almost picture this guy in tears. There's strong evidence that Isaac Royal uh, raped Belinda and had two children by her. Uh, mm. And that's a whole nother. And I think that part of Belinda's anger in the petition is directed towards him for you know, as I always say, the first absent fathers in this country were white people who raped black women and impregnated them. Yes, um, yes. Uh, Belinda, you know, you know, offered the petition to the Massachusetts State Legislature in 1782. They actually passed a resolution to give her or grant her reparations. And the first reparations they gave her uh, was for $1,500, the equivalent of $1,500 today, which was a lot of money back in 1781. They subsequently reneged on every other reparation. They were supposed to be paying her yearly, but did not do it. Um, I'm in the process right now. I've been running back and forth to Boston so much, they need to name one of those trains after me, but I I'm trying to find out where she is buried, and I think that I know where she is buried because I think that she should be memorialized. Uh, and I, I'm 90% sure I know where she's buried now. And hopefully in 2024, I will be able to declare that and we will have a memorial for her because her, and I don't have time to talk about Elizabeth mom, Beth, who was a great, I always get this mixed up. She was the step grandmother of WB Du Bois. And uh, the boys, uh, she also had a petition around the same time. So she's one of, you know, I think women, Callie House, uh, Mary, uh, Elizabeth Mumbet, Belinda, Queen Mother Moore, women have played a major role in the reparation struggle. In fact, I don't think there would have been an organized reparation struggle without the sisters that have helped us for the past 250 years. So I'm going to stop there. That do seven minutes, Nikichi. Yeah, uh, that's good. And to make sure we're able to get some questions in, I had pre-recorded um, something because I didn't know what my internet connection would be. I'm out of the country. Uh, so my present, my thing is six minutes. So go on, Jim, go on and put that in as opposed to me do it live. So if I do it live, I might just go on and on. So put my six minutes okay. in and we're going to get some, some Q&A. All right. So we're playing it now. This is Nikichi Taifa, and I'm pleased to discuss Reparations on Fire, How and Why It's Spreading Across America. This book, which was published at the end of 2022, is dedicated to the memories of Queen Mother Audley Moore and President Imari Abubakari Obadeli, the mother and father of the modern era reparations movement, whose feet I sat under, whom I learned from and am forever inspired by. So Reparations on Fire surveys the spread of the reparations movement's multiple fronts, encompassing the local, national, and international arenas, much of it occurring since 2020. What is new? What does the international and national tell us about the local, and what does the local tell us about the other two? Is the reparations movement now starting local and trickling up and out? And what about the role of other culpable entities outside of government, such as academic and religious institutions and corporations, industries, and private estates? This tome exists because of both the promise and danger of this moment, and because of the rapidly spreading momentum across the country on the issue. It documents and dissects the sampling of local actions that are popping up across America as the reparations movement morphs from fringe rhetoric to cautious acceptance in the form of concrete commissions and initiatives. Reparations on Fire tell stories, both inward and outward, no, new and old. Chapters one and two share my personal journey in the movement, along with a brief historical overview of the quest by Blacks for reparations in the United States. Along the way, I resurrect recent ancestors from my lifetime who have either been forgotten or swept under history's rug, such as Queen Mother Artley Moore, Dante Mari Obadeli, Attorney Chokwe Lumumba, 
Dorothy Benton Lewis and others. The burgeoning movement inside the states is the topic of chapter three, highlighting the pioneering work of mayors, city councils, and local and state commissions in opening up the caskets in their own backyards as they grapple with reparative ways for amends. This includes personal reflections of the movements of the first state to pass reparations legislation, California, and the first municipality to use a creative funding source, Evanston, Illinois. The chapter concludes with a snapshot of reparation initiatives across the country. Chapter four is my discussion and analysis of how other entities in US society, such as universities and churches, amongst other institutions and initiatives are grappling with ghosts in their own backyard. Chapter five touches on the consistent appeal of blacks in the US to international bodies for vindication of basic human rights and highlights efforts by African descendants in the Caribbean to gain acknowledgement and redress from the devastating effects of enslavement and colonialism. I close the book with chapter six, a potpourri of statements, quotes, and personal and political musings. The book's appendix representing my grounding past is near and dear to my heart. It contains the original text of Reparations Yes, the book I co-authored with New African Independence Movement leaders Lumumba and Obadeli during the dawning of the modern era reparations movement. We published several editions over the years from 1987 to 1995, and I'm including as the appendix to reparations on fire, the first edition for both its historic value and as a current tribute to both unsung and now ancestral leaders in the original BLM, the Black Liberation Movement. Reparations on Fire describes history in the making. It is part historical analysis, part revolutionary manifesto, and part political red alert. The local must inform the national, and the national must inform the international, and vice versa. The public must see the fault lines clearly while there is still time to course correct. Victory, unquestionably, is certain. But that our triumph constitutes actual redress and repair, as opposed to subtle advancement and subterfuge. With reparations on fire, I am proud to bring additional value to the reparations movement as it goes about the necessary task of concretizing its goals and objectives and envisioning a future where Black freedom and joy can flourish. The quest for reparations is equal parts edgy, exciting, transformational, confrontational, messy, and confusing. Reparations on Fire proves that we are now beyond rhetoric and well into action mode. Fire illuminates, purifies, and brings warmth, but can also cause pain, damage, and destruction. It can symbolize the eternal flame of hope or signify ruin and demise. The spirit of reparations is sweeping the country like fire. Whether it heals or consumes depends on how America responds to its long overdue debt and possibly portends the future of democracy, both domestic and global. Reparations on fire, Reparations on fire, how and why it's spreading across America. Thank you. That was good. Thank you. My 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 battery is dying. I have to move the computer somewhere else. I might not have much light. Uh, wait a minute. Because I'm on an international. Okay, wait a minute. Okay, go on, Jam. All right, no problem. Um, so thank you everyone for uh, going over you all's books. Yeah. It has been very amazing hearing the stories behind why you wrote your books. I am not sure how we should move forward with the Q and A. Um, this is scheduled to end at eight thirty, but we can stay on a few minutes uh, later if folks are okay with that. I feel like the first question has been answered, but if any of you wanted to. Uh, go a little bit more into it, um, very brief, uh, then here's an opportunity. Uh, the first question um, that myself and Akichi would like to ask is, um, 
Toni Morrison once said, if there's a book that you want to read, but it hasn't been written yet, then you must write it. What inspired you to write your book? What weren't you seeing that needed to be said concerning reparations? I do feel like a, a, a number of you already answered that question. So if y'all think I, we can yeah. move on. Okay, yeah. Move we on. All right, great. <laughs> um, what didn't you get to say um, or what topic concerning reparations do you wish that you could expound upon more? So sometimes, and even with writing your books, you may not have the opportunity to really go into a certain topic uh, more. Is there anything that you wish that you could delve into more concerning reparations? I'll jump in. I would have. What's the answer? Yeah. I'm sorry. I said it's only if anyone wants to answer. So you go for it. Yeah, I'll quickly answer. I would have went deeper into how we base our demand. Uh, I talked about uh, genocide, plunder, and apartheid. I would have went deeper in explaining, giving more examples of how genocide looks in our community. Uh, I talked. I think I talked about the health disparity, the lifespan disparity uh, in Chicago, the lifespan between white men and black men is 30 years. And ever since I think it was 12 years across the board, white men and women to black men and women. This is an ind 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 indicator of genocide, the mental health conditions. I, I would have went deeper into explaining and showing how these indices of genocide look in our community. I would have went deeper into uh, the multiple periods of multi-billion dollar plunder in various communities, in America in general, but also every community can detail the plunder, economic plunder uh, that has took place in, the, in their communities because it happened across the board. And I went deeper into uh, apartheid. Again, anywhere you see disparities in a, in, a, in a population between black and white, that's evidence of apartheid. And so that I would, because I still get questions and calls about, you know, how do we make our demand? Do we have to craft a harm report? And you should. Uh, but I went deeper into uh, helping people to really uncover uh, the indices of genocide, plunder, and apartheid. May I speak to that question also? I would oh, have, yeah. um, you know, I I would have drawn a tighter connection between um, between slavery and mass incarceration because that's something where, in cases where there are um, people who are exonerated and found to have been wrongfully incarcerated they often do not receive reparations. And to me, it's a kind of a modern day example of how this devaluation of black life continues, that you can do these kinds of um, crimes to people, crimes against humanity, and then offer them nothing in reparation or compensation from what they had to go through. And then we're still doing it. And we're doing it in the context of exonerations, where people are exonerated, but they don't qualify for very, um, for, for almost irrelevant reasons. I mean, sometimes they want them to prove that they're actually innocent, even though they've been exonerated by the legal system, in order to get the compensation for, some, for having their freedom taken away from them for something that they didn't do. That would make a good book. That would make a good book, Wesley. You need to write that book next. I need to finish the book I'm writing now. <laughs> Can't wait for it. Thank you for that answer. Um, so, uh, Dr. Barry, this one I think is for you from Emil Car Shabazz. Has the conviction of Callie House been overturned and her good name restored? Oh, there was a uh, there are a group of folks at Harvard who've been trying to get. It done. I went up there and uh, they had a session on it uh, in Tennessee, where she was from. Uh, one of my good friends, Francis Guest, who was very uh, influential black Republican in that state, had a movement to with the legislature to try to get her exonerated. But then he unfortunately passed away and no one has picked it up yet. The other thing is we need to move on that. 
there needs to be. The other thing is that we haven't found her grave. I was listening to you, Raymond, talk, Ray, talking about uh, finding uh, uh, the, the Brenda Sutton's uh, grave. We, I walked that Trump, that cemetery where she's supposed to be. They got no markers, nothing. My nephew went with me. We've been over there so many times. Uh, I need some young people to go and help me to find her grave down there. That's one thing I want to do before I die. And the other thing is that we need to have a move to get her, uh, get her pardoned. Thank you. I'm trying to get some of the questions from the audience. Uh, this one is from Kabibi Tahimba. The reparations movement is at a critical stage. Can you speak to the importance of unity and the need for making room for the many different approaches to making our demand reality? Anyone could answer this question. I have a, a, a suggestion, just a quick one. Um, we need some narratives that will be totally unexpected to influence public opinion. And I don't know who's gonna do with them, but we need some narratives from some reconstructed racist white people who in fact support reparations. I did an interview with New York Times about a year and a half ago about a white woman who was a reconstructed racist and her family had had slaves and all that. And she was trying to figure out what to do uh, to help their descendants and who lived near her in some little town. And uh, she wanted to sell all of her property and give them everything she had. But then I said, if you do that, you won't have anything. You need to go talk to them and make peace with them and you guys figure it out. But the interview and the story was very, very, uh, was responded to very well by the white folks who respond to the Times comments. <laughs> I think that in this climate, we, we make the case ourselves and we add to the case uh every time we do something but for those people who are who got their hands on the benjamins the money <laughs> and who don't want to do anything i'm talking about the national thing and in some communities where they don't want to do anything they need to hear from these people you know jimmy carter used to call himself uh, tell us he was a reconstructed racist that's where i got that from uh, but we need some white folk like that i don't know any do y'all know any uh, anybody know any so actually, you know, families had slaves or something, you know, that we could get to do some narratives. Yeah, actually, there are white people who are organizing in white communities to do uh, just that. There are several organizations that um, work um, are connected to the black movement uh, who are doing uh, just that. And I'm I'm happy to provide you. In fact, it might have been your uh, article, your your quote, your your um, interview with, with the New York Times a couple of years ago that might have helped to uh, spur that. So that is in fact uh, happening uh, right now. So um, I can. We talk need a you. book, Natasha. We need a book like yeah. you did the one on fire with well, the interviews the that, that can go called, out to people. What is it? Rich white men that uh, Garrett Newman did. That's trying to organize or mobilize um, white people with means. Uh, to look at this issue of reparations. So, but you're right. There needs to be, yeah, you're right. So there might be even be some folk on the on the line here who are listening to that. Yeah. While we're speaking about this, um, Dr. Barry, someone asked, when you're talking about narrative, do you think a movie would be a good idea about Callie House, similar to what was the movie that was about Harriet Tubman? Would that help with narrative and media? Yeah, I think that movies would help. A movie about her, a movie about Callie House, a movement about um, uh, Queen Mother, somebody, you know, but Callie House would be a good one for a story. Some people came to me right after I wrote the book and said they were thinking about doing something, but they didn't raise the money. Uh, but I think that that kind of documentary in the environment that we have now, depending on how it was done, would be very useful. And, and I want to point out that they that one one effective uh, movie and documentary that I would recommend that people show to their students in their classes when the issue of reparations comes up and how it can move is the big payback, the big payback, the movie by Erica Alexander, which documents the reparations campaign in Evanston, Illinois. 
And so, uh, and so this should, uh, is an excellent film, uh, focusing on, uh, Robin Ruth Simmons and, and, and the mobilization in Evanston and the, uh, campaign that actually get where African Americans actually receive reparations and have received and a reparations payment. So that's the big payback. And that can, that, and that film is available, uh, for showing, uh, right now. It's been on PBS. And and I recommend it highly. Thank you so much. Um, some I think Alita Tere asked Dr. Wimbush if you could put your information about the Boston Memorial in the chat that she knows some folks uh, in Boston that may be able to help. Um, mm -hmm. So if you could put your website and information in the chat, um, that would be helpful. Um, then there's a question for uh, Brother Cam. Will you write a second edition of laying the groundwork for local reparations? And then there's another question. What is the status of the local initiative in Chicago now? <clears throat> the second edition, I think a second edition probably would be something that would be collaborative. Uh, something uh, definitely Robin Sim Bruce Simmons would have to be uh, leading, co-leading in that. And you have many people on this call um, Emil Shabazz, Robin Proudy, Kathleen Anderson, um, and uh, I think I saw Mickey Dean from Kansas City. All who are doing local reparations work all can be contributors to that that second edition because you know each one of them have some very unique experiences that they have endured uh, to get their local reparations efforts uh, done. So I think that's a collaborative effort and something that uh, uh, at the Evanston Local Reparations Symposium of November 3rd, 30th to December 2nd, I'll uh, probably raise that issue. But thanks for that question. As far as Chicago, um, Dr. Barry was absolutely right. <laughs> Elections don't end. Anything, that, you know, uh, you vote and that's it. Uh, in the Chicago election for mayor in the primary, uh, my organization, Reparation United, had a candidate forum. Uh, five out of the nine candidates had to speak to the issue of reparations. There were probably about nine questions that we asked them, and uh, we put forth what we what I call a, what we call a robust reparations plan, which consisted of a, a reparations commission, a office of Black Chicagoans, um, a repair to basic income program for young people who were locked into the informal economy to to plan and to get an intentional plan to move them from the informal economy to the formal economy and the uh, introduction of a slavery disclosure and redress ordinance. Uh, after the election, uh, the uh, mayor uh, who, who, was, who was elected, Brandon Johnson, a brother, committed to the robust plan. And just last week, uh, he came out. Uh, we were having, we've been agitating and, 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 and uh, organizing way after the election to get this robust plan initiated. And, uh, and get reparations in the budget. And he came out uh, last week with $500,000 $500, commitment to a reparations commission and a $5 million commitment to an office of uh, formerly incarcerated, which would include the repair to basic income program. So we're still you know, pushing for the other two, the Office of Black Americans, and we're pushing for the slave disclosure and redress ordinance uh, we're gonna introduce and get enforced so we can target some of these non governmental complicit agents. But you know, the work is long after the long after the election. And you know, that what happened in Chicago was testament to that. And certainly as Dr. Berry talked about, we had a very critical and crucial time in this upcoming election that we can actually uh, leverage the dependency of the Democratic Party on the black vote to get something yeah. passed right now. And so Dr. Berry, I look forward to talking to you more about that. Uh, and yeah, because we need, you know, your brilliance. You I'm reading a book I wrote, my uh, one before the one I'm publishing now, is called History Teaches Us to Resist. Okay. And it's Thank about you. organizing and how you get, you know, and stuff, movements I've been in and others and what people have to do to make their vote count and to push and to get people to be responsive. And you have to get commitments before you vote, not That's after right. you vote. And you have That's to right. push them from day one and keep on pushing them. Persistence is the main thing, stick to itiveness. 
Okay. All right. All right. Thank you, Dr. Mary. <laughs> I'm ordering that book right away. <laughs> So this question is for all the panelists. Um, did you face any difficulties in writing your book? I know that you talked, you all talked about like having difficulties finding graves. Were there any other like difficulties in writing your book, for example, with research or information and how did you overcome it? Let, let me share one. Uh, uh, when I was doing Should America Pay, uh, Harper Collins wanted, uh, Nantumbi Tutu did the, uh, introduction uh, for me, Bishop oh. Tutu's, Archbishop Tutu's daughter. Oh. She was she and I were working uh, oh. with each other at Fisk University, and they actually did not want to publish the book because in it, um, Nantumbi made a reference, and it was a legitimate reference to Israel's uh, annexation of Palestine. And they actually uh -oh. called me and said, uh, with Dr. Wimbush, if Nantumi doesn't take out that reference, we're not going to publish the book. And so I held firm and said, well, then don't publish the book. And about 20 minutes later, she called me and said that she would publish the book. So there's a lot of politics to publishing, at least I've run into them. Um, there were a group of people who tried to stop uh, should America pay? I won't say what that group was, but uh, from being published because they said it was being published by black nationalists. And uh, they wanted a book that was more like a socialistic, you know, kind of Marxist orientation to it. So, you know, there, there's a lot of, you know, behind the scenes, at least again, it's been with me about, uh, you know, writing certain things uh, about I, I don't, I don't want to talk about uh, the book I just did on uh, Francis Cress Wells. There were well. politics about that too, but that's a whole nother discussion too. Well, what I had was the Justice Department refused to let me look at some of the papers on Callie House's case. Wow! And I um, uh, happened to be there's one was one black woman who was a professional at the National Archives at the time that I was doing that. So you don't believe this, but this was way in two, 2000 by the time I published the thing. And they had many the other there. You know, there's one other man is there now. The woman died, Sarah, Sarah Jackson. And uh, she, I went over to see her and she took me way back in the bowels of the archives and found the papers over in the corner and gave me the litigation papers. The reason why they didn't want me to have them, well, and I put this, it didn't, I put that they wouldn't give me to them, but I used the papers, is that the lawyers of the Justice Department told the court that Callie House was a fraud because she had no chapters and that she was lying and that she made up all these stories and pretended like she had, and she was just stealing people's money for nothing. And I found the chapter records of the chapter in uh, Missouri in that pile. And it had all the names of the people who were in there. Somebody wrote their names down. Some of them couldn't write. It even had little things like uh, Johnny was supposed to pay 25 cents due. He ain't got 25 cents. <laughs> But when he get it, he uh, pay. <laughs> uh, Crazy said, I'm so tired. I'm nine years old and I'm still working for them same white folk I wore for when I was a slave. But anyway, their records were all there, the chapter and how she met with them and all this kind of stuff and other chapters. And they had lied. They told the court in that case. Today, if a, liar tell, a, court, a lawyer tells the court a lie like that, and suppresses evidence and doesn't give it, they can get ethically punished or they can get disbarred for that. Wesley, isn't that right? You don't go around suppressing uh, materials that would be ex exculpatory, uh, mm -hmm. any materials at all. They're supposed to share with both sides. That's but, right. Uh, there was that. And so I put the whole, and I have a chapter in the Cal House book on that chapter in Columbia, Missouri, and all the things that they said. But they didn't want me to see those records, so they just told me they didn't have them. I, you know, if, if I did, they did have them. I couldn't see them, but I, so I got Mary, over anyway. 
Uh, Dr. Berry, that reminds me of a discussion at this international conference I'm at right now that uh, records um, from the enslavement era in, in the Netherlands and other places have been sealed for hundreds of years uh, because they don't want, they want to make sure everyone's dead and passed away and there's no memory and all like that. And the, all that is part of the harm. The whole COINTELPO counterintelligence files, the ones that were finally released pursuant to Freedom of Information Act are heavily, heavily, uh, uh, you know, redacted. Um, so that, all that, it's got to be part of reparations claim. Um, one thing I want to say about the answer to the question about any difficulties, research um, in the like, um, I had, um, um, taken the tack of, because uh, my book came out in 2022, of, of trying to um, um, list the different jurisdictions that have, um, uh, that were considering or passed reparations commissions or task force to look into the issue. Well, it almost was um, obsolete almost as soon as the book came out, because like I said, the, the issue is just spreading across the country like, on fire. So in retrospect, I probably would not have included that and just directed people to sources who are keeping that type of information updated or on a, a daily basis. So that's what I would say for my answer to that question about difficulties. Thank you. Um, and I know that certain books are are already predicated on a specific historical figure, but like throughout your work for all of you all, is there a specific historical figure, elder or ancestor that guides the trajectory of your work? That's the easy one for me. Uh, Queen Mother Ali Moore, Imario Bukari, Obadali, and Chokwe Lumumba. Minerva Azalea Hawkins, who was my high school history teacher and who uh, told me, you are diamond in the rough, you poor little old thing, dirty thing. Go get the, uh, give me your jacket so I can take it and get it clean. Uh, <laughs> but you, I'm going to work on you and because you, you got a brain and you got a mind and you're wow. smart. And so she gave me books. She had me come by her house and, and talk to her and her mother about the books after school. And she did everything that she could. But one thing stuck in my mind through my whole career that she told me beyond that was she said every time I would complain about being attacked politically when I was doing stuff, she'd say, when you're in the limelight, you make a good target. So I kept that in mind, too. So don't get okay. out of the limelight if you don't want to be attacked. Yeah. For me, it's John Hope Franklin, who told me when I was his student and then our, you know, association over the years told me never to retire. And I'm, I'm thinking about disagreeing with him about that. And uh, even though I'm in psychology, he said to always have history at the bottom of what you do. So I've always followed that. He's guided a lot of what I've done. For me, what I wanted to... Uh... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, BP. Okay. Um, <clears throat> when I issued the call for papers for reparations, uh, for re special issue of reparations, I got all kind of negative feedback from people. And they said that nobody's going to give black people reparations. Why you think that you should have issued this call for this for a special issue on reparations and stuff? And they said, do you, do you're not going to get any kind of response. But Dr. Ron Walters, he responded immediately. And he had been a hero of mine who had who had been in South Africa and, and worked on the reconciliation uh, commissions in South Africa and had written numerous books on, on uh, um, po mm -hmm. black politics and was a, social, a scholar activist and worked with Jesse Jackson, et cetera. And he, he came, responded positively and said, yes, you should do this. And he was the first person to actually send in a, he contacted me and said, this is great. You should be doing this. And then sent in a manuscript. So, uh, so this special, that special issue, he, unfortunately he passed away before the special issue was published in 2012, but he, he kept me going when other people said, you're wasting your time on reparations. Okay. 
Yeah, when I joined in Cobra in 2006, there was uh, probably just three of the original founders still with the organization active at that time. One was Queen Mother Dorothy Lewis, the other was Baba Hannibal Afrique, and the other was General Rashid. And uh, Queen Mother Dorothy Lewis, probably the story I was told that she was the one who went to Dr. Obradelli to ask her to, him to help her help start a national uh, organization for reparations uh, that was not str strictly in the nationalist movement. And uh, she, her and Bobby, Hann Bobby Hannibal was the only four-time elected male co-chair of INCOBRA. I was three-time elected uh, male co-chair. And both of them showed me what a national leader of reparations looks like and the, the, the degree of dedication to study as well as work. It was dual uh, to be a leader of, of a national organization for reparations. And so uh, I tried to carry on in their tradition and still try to carry on in their tradition. Thank you. If, if no one else uh, wants to answer, I can go on to the next question. Um, so How there's, long are you going to be on here, baby? How long um, are we going? I think we need to end in the next couple minutes. <laughs> yes, because we are past time. Yes, ma'am. So um, we'll ask this one more question because it was a it was. Go ahead. Go ahead. Twice. Somebody asked about the importance of internal reparations or self reparations, and this is like black people collectively taking our own things, investing in ourselves. They wanted to know what you all thought about that and its importance. So I personally, this is my personal, I, I, that is totally and completely critical. I don't call that reparations though. I, I just don't, but we need healing in our uh, community. We need some healing. It's a quarter to two right here where I am right now. I need to go to sleep. But um, I, we, we need internal healing. Someone can disagree with me. I don't know if I call that rep reparations though. Reparations for my soul. Right. Okay. Okay. Remember those songs? You don't you guys don't know that song? Who gonna pay Paul reparations for my soul? Right. 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 Revolution will not be televised. Well, That's, right. That's right. Yes, he said he can feel yeah, he wrote reparations for my soul. What we need is reparations also for our souls. That's right. The damage done to our souls. Nobody knows that song except me. I'll be doggone. <laughs> yes, that was way back in the day. It's, I remember. Know, old school. <laughs> self care. Yeah, yeah. So I, I agree. I think self care is extremely important. And I do consider that to be part of reparations. I just, I, I, I like a, a broad definition. You know, even if we're talking about material reparations, you know, if we if we're paying into the system, we're going to end up paying our own reparations in, in that fashion. So, you know, I mean, I don't I don't have a problem with that. I, I think it has to be accompanied with acknowledgement and apology and and recognition of why it's being done. But. But yeah, I think we can participate in our own reparations. So on that, I think we're going to close it out this evening. I want to thank all of the speakers. Um, and I I wanted to let people know, so many people ask where the recording will be. We're going to publish it on the Nikichi's YouTube channel. And it's going to be sent to everyone that registered for this event tonight. Again, we want to thank you all for all the attendees will also include links to books. And um, sorry, we couldn't get to all the questions tonight, but if you have any pressing questions, you can email them to me at info at NBCIT.org and I will forward them to the speakers. Again, thank you so much for joining us tonight at the Reparation Information Thought Series. Thank you to all the speakers. Thank you to all the attendees for staying on with us a few minutes longer. Have a great night. Bye. Thank you. 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 Great job. <laughs>